Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, um, Behind the Tap Room with Jax Abbey. Um, we'll be joining the quality manager there, Jeremy Cross, shortly to get a tour of their lab and to learn more about their quality program. Um, really excited about today's Behind the Tap Room. We had started it off last month with Allagash, um, with Zach Boda giving us a tour there. So excited to move to Massachusetts and see what they've got at Jax Abbey. Um, let me introduce myself first. I'm Lucy Benedict. I'm the founder and director at the Quality C Control Collaboratory, or QC2 Lab for short, at the University of Southern Maine. I'm also a full-time chemistry professor there. I teach analytical chemistry, um, which I love because analytical chemistry is really dissecting substances to find out what they're made of. And beer is like the perfect substance. Um, it's fascinating because right from the beginning, its ingredients change so much um, in composition as they go through the brewing process from just making the mash and then going to the wort and the boil and then fermentation. And then you get this final product and that's continually changing. And so there's so much to study and learn about beer um, from a chemistry and a biology perspective. I find it fascinating. Um, that's one of the reasons that I started the QC2 lab at USM uh, in 2016. It's devoted to quality testing research and education um, for the craft beverage, specifically really the craft brewing industry. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about research later when Jeremy and I um, can share a little bit about the collaboration that we're doing. Um, that's one of the things that makes us unique. But the other thing that really makes our lab unique is that so much of the work that we do is done by our undergraduates who are trained in the lab. So our undergraduates are learning how to do these tasks and then performing these tasks for brewers. They're learning about research and then being able to do their own independent research within our lab. So it's really fun. It's really educational for them. Um, and we're really lucky to have partners like Jack's Abbey to help support us. Um, all of the funding for our lab comes from grants. The Maine Economic Improvement Fund has helped seed this lab and continue its, um, its growth. We get money from brewers um, for doing testing and education for many of our webinars. And then we also have research partners who help support those projects. So um, it's a lot of different places to get support from and we're really, really thankful for it. Um, if you want to learn more about us, we're at qc2.beer. Um, I'll talk more about our offerings at the end, but you want to get to the webinar. So uh, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. First, there's a lot of people here today, which we're really excited about. So if you have a question, and we hope you have questions, there are no stupid questions. There are stupid questions, but none of you will ask them. All of your questions are great questions today. So there's a Q&A button um, probably at the bottom of your screen, although if you're on a mobile device, I'm not sure what that looks like, but you'll have a Q&A button. Use that please to ask questions anytime. Um, I will be fielding the questions to Jeremy as we go. There'll also be question and answer section at the end. So if I don't get to your question while we're doing the tour, it means I'm just saving it for the end for our Q&A section. There's also a chat feature that we can use where you can chat to the panelists and attendees, share information if you have it. I might post some links in there, information for you if it's appropriate. Um, but for any questions, please try to use the question and answer button because that's the easiest for uh, me to manage with all the people there. If you have a complicated question, let me know in the Q&A section and then raise your hand because sometimes I know it's easier for you to say it than it is to type it all out. Um, and so we can use that feature as well as we get towards the end, but just save the raise hand for the end of the session. Okay, so now on to the good stuff. Um, I met Jeremy back in 2019 at the Craft Brewers Conference. I just finished giving a talk on sensory and we caught up afterwards where he was looking for DMS testing, which is kind of funny because there was no way I wanted to, to test for dimethyl sulfide. Uh, it smells horrible. It's hard to analyze. Um, and here we are two years later almost, and we're working on this big project where DMS is one of our key components and I'm analyzing it and I figured it out. So I appreciate him kind of pushing me forward. Um, and that first conversation that I had with Jeremy, it was really clear that he is passionate about quality in the craft beer brewing industry. Um, and he's extremely knowledgeable about quality in this industry. And from what I've 
learned from, from Jeremy and talking to their team is that it's a culture at Jack's Abbey, which I think is really, really important. Um, over the past 20 years, I learned from LinkedIn that Jeremy has worked at over at least seven different breweries. Um, he started as a brewery apprentice and has worked his way up to head brewer, Q, QAQC manager, um, and he's been all over the place, Alaska, California, Massachusetts. It's really impressive. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Jeremy take it over. I'm going to stay here and ask questions and, and join the conversation when appropriate, but I'm excited for this tour. Thank you, Lucy. Um, can you hear me? Hear okay, you. excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our lab tour. Um, we will give you a short tour of the lab, um, and then with the re remaining 59 minutes and 45 seconds, um, I can kind of show you a little presentation on what we uh, do for quality, excuse me, quality here. Um, and then as Lucy mentioned, we'll discuss uh, a little bit of uh, this pretty cool project we're doing together. And then the uh, floor will be open to um, questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna take you around our, our um, lab that's small in size, but large in stature. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll just start off by saying, you don't need a huge, if you're a smaller brewery looking for, to, to start a lab program or expand a lab program, quality program, um, you don't need a massive, uh, a massive lab with tons of expensive equipment. Um, don't let that be a hindrance to you to, to start a good solid quality program. You just, you know, start with what you got and you work your way up. Your budget will tell you what you can do and what you can't do. And then, you know, eventually as your pro, as your brewery grows, your program grows, so does your lab and your uh, quality team. So, um, this will be a good, good, uh, ex explanation of that when you see how massive our lab is. So um, one of our neatest little uh, toys we got is our um, PCR. Uh, we recently got this gene up, let's see here, sorry. Um, so this is our, we just upgraded in September to real-time PCR. Uh, we upgraded from endpoint PCR. And if you don't know what PCR is, it's polymerase chain reaction. A lot of you might've heard about PCR, um, particularly during COVID. You know, a lot of those COVID tests are done uh, for PCR. Um, what it does for us is rapid detection for potential beer spoiling uh, microorganisms, such as uh, bacteria, wild yeast. Um, so we can load up, load up our samples, prep our samples, put them in the PCR, uh, and it's going to give us a good indication, not only as if, you know, we're having some microbial issues, but also what those issues might be. Um, I'll get into that a little more uh, during the presentation. Um, we also have our uh, orbital shaker here. Um, orbital shaker is very useful. Right now you're seeing a forced fermentation. Uh, this is a beer we brewed yesterday, our house lager, it's our, um, our flagship brand. Um, and we do have forced fermentations for every single thing we brew here. Uh, the purpose is to, uh, it's, it's multifaceted, but one is to make sure that there's enough uh, fermentable sugars in, in the product we brewed so that uh, maybe there wasn't an uh, issue in the brew house and maybe from, uh, mash temperatures were too high. Um, it's good to have that information, but also we do spunding here at Jack's Abbey and I'll get into that too. Since we're a lager producing brewery, um, we naturally carbonate our beers. And we do this by closing off the tank at a certain point um, in order to capture the rest of the CO2 that's being produced during fermentation. Uh, we don't wanna do it too early because we'll also capture some, um, some of these unpleasant uh, uh, volatiles that Lucy's been so, uh, so graciously um, testing for us. Um, so forced fermentation is very important. Uh, orbital shaker, uh, these things are great to have in the lab. They're not too expensive. Um, it's, it's good to keep things in suspension to get more contact time with things. Sometimes we'll do benchtop flavor trials with certain things. And what we'll do is uh, put tinctures on there that we might dose a beer or a, or a seltzer or something with. Um, and it helps keep it in contact with what you want to extract out of it. Um, every Every lab or every brewery should have a pH meter. pH, um, 
pH is extremely important in the brewing process. Um, so we really monitor pH throughout the entire process uh, from, from mash in till the very end of, uh, of it, till the time when it goes into a can or bottle. Um, we, you know, I'll give you a little tour just to show you how it's not a very big lab. Um, but, you know, we make do with what we got. Uh, we do have a hot plate, a mini centrifuge, a, a balance, a larger centrifuge. Um, centrifuges are very useful. Uh, it helps you to clarify certain things. It helps in processing um, when we do testing uh, for PCR or IBUs or other things. Um, we do have our laminar flow hood and our fume hood here. Um, the fume hood here has our spectrophotometer in there. Uh, we use a spectrophotometer for IBU testing, for color, um, other tests too, uh, to test for yeast, assimil yeast assimilable nitrogen, yen, easy for me to say, um, for seltzers and cider. Um, the fume hood is very important for safety purposes. Uh, we do use things in there that are, could be harmful if you inhale it. Um, iso-octane for the IBU test. We weigh out our, um, our powders in there so you know, we don't inhale them and they just go through the uh, filter. Um, and the laminar flow hood, that's uh, where we do all our aseptic work. Uh, basically, uh, what it does is it just it filters air through laminar flow. Um, everything's coming in, the filtered air is coming in through the top. So theoretically, when you sanitize everything and spray down everything with uh, isopropyl alcohol and go in there, um, you should have kind of a clean slate. So you shouldn't be worried about contaminating microplates or anything like that um, when you're working in the hood, as long as you have proper aseptic technique. Um, we do have, I think, I think it's important for a lot of labs or breweries to have autoclaves. Um, we use our autoclave for a few things. One, um, we don't, we, we, carbonation stones are a good place to harbor uh, bacteria. So every time we clean a tank, we put a carbonation stone in the, um, inside the uh, autoclave. So we kill any potential uh, beer spoilers in there. We also uh, do it when we create media. When we make media, um, we have to sterilize the media to make sure, again, we're starting with a clean slate and we, we're not having other microbes growing on there that may or may not have been in our beer. Um, here, we have some of our packaging QC stuff. Uh, that's a can cutter. I'll show you that later. Um, it it's basically cuts into the seam, so we can do seam checks throughout the packaging run. Um, you'll see pictures of what that looks like. Um, and we also have our, um, this is, this is our, our favorite, most used piece of equipment. It's our um, density meter and alkalizer from Anton Parr, DMA 4500. Um, this thing is extremely useful. Uh, we work the hell out of it. Um, it's, it's not a cheap piece of equipment, but I really don't know what we would do here without it. Um, we certainly have made a lot of friends in the industry and, you know, a lot of, we're, we're you know, we have neighbors that like to come by and use it, and that's fine. You know, we're happy to do, happy to help them out as long as they bring beer. Um, let's see, we also have a turbidity meter. I'll show you what that looks like, um, but we can check the turbidity in our beers. Um, you know, we're looking at really low, low numbers for stuff for our lagers or pilsners, like our house lager and stuff like that. Um, then, of course, we do do a few of those New England IPAs, and we want those uh, numbers way up. Um, with regards to cell counting yeast management, we, we go kind of old school. We got the uh, microscope with a hemocytometer. Um, so really all we're doing is doing the, the um, five box count when we will get a slurry of yeast from the brewers, they'll bring it to us. Um, we'll do a slurry count, we'll dilute it to about a dilution factor of 200. Um, so we're not counting hundreds and hundreds of cells per, per uh, chamber there. Um, and then we will convert that into mass into a pitchable amount that the uh, brewers will pitch into each batch. And then um, they'll bring the knockout to us and see how close we were to accurate. Um, we're generally pretty good. We're usually within 5% of what, what our target was. Uh, so that, that works out pretty well. Um, here we have some more packaging QC um, 
seam checks and can checks. Um, you know, it's important to make sure that uh, you're, you're getting good cans. You know, if there's, if you find, start finding leak issues, um, is that leak coming from something you're doing on the packaging side or do we have possibly have uh, faulty cans? Do we have, you know, bad seams, you know, stuff like that. So um, more often than not, it's, we're not really finding any, any problems, uh, but it's, it's definitely a useful tool to have. Um, let's see, I've really kind of taken you through everything. We do have a glass washer. We go through a ton of glassware um, mostly for sensory, um, and it's, we, we do the quality lab here. We, uh, run the sensory program as well. I know you, if any of you saw, um, the Allagash, uh, the Allagash one last week, I think was it last week? Um, last month, but <laughs> close. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last month. Sorry. Um, you know that Allagash has not only a, a quality lab, but they also have their, um, they have someone who just specializes for sensory as well. Um, we aren't quite there yet. We, uh, we take a lot of things uh, on our, we have a lot of hats. So we're, we're doing the general overall quality. We're doing the sensory. Um, we'll run the barrel program next door. Um, we're doing seltzer and cider um, operations, um, at least from a lab standpoint. We're doing flavor trials. Um, all that stuff. So we, we really aren't kind of uh, pigeonholed into, I guess, just a quality department, really. We're, we're really a mishmash of a whole lot of things that um, we, we just consider everything we do in production uh, quality from, from um, what we do in the lab to what the sellermen are doing to what the packaging people are doing, because, you know, everybody has to be on board or else it just doesn't work. Um, quality assurance is all about you know, following SOPs. Um, we have very rigid SOPs that everybody in the production team knows and follows, and that uh, allows you to really uh, make sure things are done in a repeatable, um, safe, and safe way that was going to help you produce uh, the best quality beer you can. So that is pretty much the lab. Oh, yeah, also I have a, uh, um, we have a small, that's just a little incubator. Probably didn't get a good look. Um, we also have a much bigger incubator that we keep all our um, that we keep all our uh, meat plated uh, media in. Uh, this incubator is just to warm up some beer for uh, when we do testing down the road. Um, so, with that, I will go to a unless there's any questions right off the bat. I Can go to a um there's uh, a couple questions okay. that we can pause for real quick um sure. and i will say you know it's interesting you bring up like the sops and 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 things like that that are free to start with and and that was one of the things that lisa um at austin street uh their quality control manager there had brought up is if you want to start a quality program start with the free stuff right like you don't have to put any money into that it's time and yep. those are the things that you should be starting with so think those are key anywhere um absolutely but so first question i love this question where's your gc mass spec and your lc mass spec oh that we have another <laughs> room for that oh you do okay and, and, well show us that <laughs> uh, no no that's uh, that's, that's actually where that's actually where um it's in it's in, right now it's in university of southern maine well the gc <laughs> mass spec i wish we had an lc mass spec right Right. Uh, yeah, we're not there yet. We, we have been, we had been kicking the tires. Um, I will say we have in our quality department, it's myself and my lab tech and that's it right now. So for, as far as full-time employees, um, we were doing some um, cross training with people who showed a lot of interest and maybe had a little science background. Um, obviously you just saw the size of the lab. It's not big. So during these times um, we're trying not to keep that many people in here. So um, for the time being, it's just myself and my lab tech. And from what I gather, uh, mass spec, um, takes, you know, it takes a lot of work and takes a lot of upkeep. And, and from what I've heard from other people, it's almost, you need a, a full-time employee just to run it really. Um, which is time we don't really have right now. Um, it's, it's certainly not something that we're, 
we're not thinking about. Um, we're, we've, we've talked to a few different companies and, and um, I look forward to going into Lucy's lab and, and checking out all her stuff. And, and then I might come back uh, with a huge laundry list of things I want. I want uh, Jack to buy me. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And I will say that um, next month for our Behind the Tap Room, we're going down to um, Creature Comforts down in Georgia and they have a GC mask spec there. So it will be really interesting to hear kind of how they integrated that in um, and learned about it. They have the same one I do. So it's been really helpful. Oh, good. Uh, share uh, I already, data. I already registered for that one. Awesome. <laughs> um, you answered one of the other questions was about how many um, people work in there. So I'll click that one off. Um, one question we have, two questions we have about the forced fermentation. Uh, well, actually, sorry, two questions about yeast. Um, first is the forced fermentation is you showed us the forced fermentation uh, via the shaker flask agitation. Can this method be extrapolated to the bulk fermentation process, um, i.e. is fermentator agitation a common practice at Jack's Abbey in order to increase contact area residence time, thereby increasing the overall reaction fermentation rate? Ah, uh, I see. Um, no, that is not something we, we have static fermenters. Uh, uh, it's they, they ferment and they, they mix solely via convection current. Um, like, like most cylinder conicals. Um, we don't have that. I, I don't know if we really have plans on, on doing that. We, we, we get pretty, uh, reliable fermentations in a, in a, in a, reliable amount of time too. So it's something that really, I mean, look, when, when you start a lager brewery, um, time is of the essence, right? It's, you, you got a lot of residency time, so we need, we need a big cellar. Um, so yeah, it, it would be nice if we can move those along a little more quickly, but for the most part, um, it's our, you know, our fermentations go pretty much like clockwork. And, um, we have a system where we don't, really feel that's something we need to to look into anytime in the near future. Excellent. Um, for cell counting for yeast, how are you ensuring um, homogeneity of yeast slurries for cell counting? Um, so that's a good question. Um, basically what we do is they, they bring it into us. We have a graduated cylinder. Um, let me, oops. It's, it's really nothing terribly fancy. Um, we, we, they, they fill this cylinder up. Um, we put it in our, our sink and we just kind of knock the hell out of it until we, we, we feel like, um, the, it's been degassed enough where we're not getting big pockets of, of CO2. Um, and we're getting a pretty homogeneous, uh, slurry. Then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll mix it up pretty well. I'll take a wide mouth pipetter, um, with the, uh, and, and, you know, pull it up, down, up, down quite a bit until we feel like we, uh, we have a pretty homogeneous mixture there. Um, and, and it may not be a perfect system, but it, 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 we're generally very close to when, when, when we suggest a pitch count of 375 liters of yeast. Um, and then we do them when we do the knockout count, it's usually within just a few percentage points of, of where the target is. So we're, we're pretty happy with how it is so far. Nice. And then we had another question about yeast is, do you keep propagate, recycle your own yeast at Jack's Abbey? And how do you do QC um, if you are recycling? We aren't yet. So we, we, um, we, about a year and a half ago, we purchased on, I don't know if you all know about bid spotter. Um, Jack loves bid spotter. He's always bidding on, on different equipment. Um, so I'd been bugging him about a yeast propagator for a while. Uh, then he got one. The good news is he got one. The bad news is it was, uh, I think, from Bridgeport Brewing's uh, original uh, original one that, you know, they they opened up in the 90s. So um, we're still working on getting that up and running um, and making sure uh, that it's, it's sanitary enough. Um, we really do cone to cone. Um, we do our, our yeast pitching, make sure we get a representative sample. Um, and we're basically just going cone to cone during uh, our first knockout and pitching the yeast so it, it mixes up pretty well. Um, we're doing, you know, we have PCR for, for yeast. Um, once we, we're gonna have a different protocol, obviously once that, um, 
once the propagator is up and running. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's it's really just just plating and PCR and 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 uh, counts viability. Awesome. Um, and those are all our yeast questions so far. I will make a shameless plug. Actually, there's some shame in there, but um, that we have a yeast management and uh, we'll include like going through yeast counting and all that workshop coming up on uh, March 11th, I think it is. So if anybody's interested in that, it's coming up. Um, question about microbial spoiler concerns. Um, are they the same for hard seltzer as those for beer? And it's a good thing they had that talk just not long ago, right? About seltzers. Yeah, absolutely. Do you mean the uh, MBA? Yeah. 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 That was a good one. Um, yeah. So we, we kind of ventured into the seltzer realm just like, hey, let's throw something against the wall and see if it works. And then without even doing, you know, any research, sometimes on the small scale, that's just what we do and say, okay, this didn't work. Why didn't it work? Maybe now we do some research. Um, so we are now doing like we currently have uh about i think 600 barrels of 600 700 barrels of, of high gravity seltzer that's going to turn into about 1200 barrels um so yeah it's, it's a whole nother issue right um you you do have to worry about contaminants the ph control is is one of the things but um yeah, you're generally worried about the same stuff because that's what's in your brewery, right? If you're, um, you, you, if you might have potential spoilers like Lactobacillus and Pediococcus um, or wild yeast. Um, yeah, you're, you're generally concerned about the same stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on seltzer as of yet, um, but I'm learning and, and I'm finding that, you know, we do the same micro protocols on, on the seltzers we do in our, all our beers and so far so good. They've been, you know, we're, we also um, will sterile filter them as well. Okay. Um, and then last question for right now is who helped you with the build out of the lab furniture? Lab furniture? Well, I think um, probably the whole lab. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I, unfortunately, I don't know that. I've been, I've been at Jack's Abbey for two, just under two and a half years. Um, and this lab has been here for longer than that. So I'd have to, I'd have to double check on that. I'm not positive. Okay. Cool. All right. Those are our questions for right now. Okay. Well, I will um, go ahead and share my screen and it'll give you a little uh, better than that kind of chintzy uh, tour I just gave. It should hopefully show a little more about what we do here. Um, all right. All right. Is that uh, is that working? Yes, that is working. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, the the question is, what do we do here? Um, there's, like I said, we 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 wear a lot of hats in the quality department at Jack's Abbey. Um, but one thing I will say is that. Uh, something that Lucy mentioned earlier, and we were talking about SOPs, um, the don't let money get in the way of a good quality program. Um, there's a lot of things you can do uh, without having to spend much money. And the first thing I'm going to go over, which, which we, we briefly touched on, is uh, sensory, right? Um, so in the lab, we measure turbidity, color, IBU, and all that stuff. Um, but the most important piece of equipment is, is you, the individual, um, you know, that we may have hard numbers for what we, what we want with regards to specifications of each beer, but if it doesn't taste good, then, then what's the point? Um, so sensory is the most important thing and, and you can invest in really expensive sensory software. We have some of it, um, or you can just sit down with a beer and a pen and pencil and or a pen and paper and um, and critique your beer and analyze it and know what you're and try to figure out what you're looking for. Um, so basically, the, here's all the things we do for sensory. Uh, one of one is go no go. Uh, that should be a process any brewery should implement. Um, 
anytime you're moving beer from one part place to another, whether it's fermenter to um, bright, whether it's bright to packaging, you want to be testing your beer. You want to make sure that um, it's good to go. And if it's not, maybe you can do something about it. But if if you don't do a go no go and you move it to the next level, not only you're you're wasting materials, right? If it's not ready to go um, and you move it from bright to packaging, then all of a sudden you've packaged beer that's not ready to go. And instead of just dumping a beer down the drain, which hope which you know may have been a, a contaminated batch, not only you're dumping beer down the drain but you are all those cans and lids and the packaging team that went in the, their hours, um, all these things that could have been avoided if you just up, for, you know, did some sensory upstream. Um, so I can't stress enough how important that is. Um, and everybody needs to know you, you need to have people sign off on it to, you know, a certain amount of people just say, Hey, look, this, this beer, I have a question about it. Um, let's, let's hold it up and, and do a little more research on it because, you know, you are going to see get pushback sometimes from sales and marketing and distribution, but you'll get a lot more pushback if a bad product goes out into the market. Um, I mentioned the sensory software. We have something called Draft Lab. Maybe some of you out there have it. Um, it's really convenient. It's great. You know, you can. It's an app on your phone where you can do sensory. We do um, uh, two or three beers a week that we package on that we do specifically. Um, for draft lab, and then we use draft lab for all sorts of other things for training, um, training staff, we can record training, we can do all sorts of neat things. Um, so, like I said, you don't need sensory software to do sensory. Um, it's, it makes it easier to compile information, you know, if, if, if I can look back at a beer we, we sampled um, two years ago and figure out if, if people uh, passed it or not, or gave it, you know, gave it, said it was true to brand. Um, attribute sampling. Um, we do have a sister brewer. I don't know how many people are aware that Jack's Abbey, there's also Springdale Beer Company. Um, that's next door. And we, Jack's Abbey is all lagers. Spring, anything that's not a lager is Springdale. So we do also have a barrel aged sour program, which can drive a, a quality manager a little bonkers sometimes. It's a little scary. Um, but, uh, you know, they're very complex beers. And so for sensory, we'll do attribute sampling where we'll sit down with a new beer we haven't done before, but you know, it's got maybe apricot in it and, and Britannomyces and lacto and PDO. So you're basically ranking how sour it is, how funky it is, how, how tannic it is or woody or oaky or, you know, mouthfeel, that kind of thing. Um, we also do barrel sampling. We had, uh, we have quite a few barrels over there. So we have to go over there and do sensory and see what's, what's ready and what's not. These, these barrels take a long time to develop the flavors you want. Sometimes they never do, but you have to know that, um, you have to know what's kind of where everything is, uh, and where it's ready to, if it's ready to be packaged or if it looks like it needs another year, another six months. Um, so we, we do barrel sampling over at Springdale. Um, beer and process sampling, that's again, something you should do all the time. You should be tasting your work. You should be tasting, um, you know, if you're doing gravity, daily gravity, tasting the beer. Um, does this beer, if you've added fruits, spices and what other, and any other adjunct to it, um, does this beer taste as we intended it to? And, and if not, well, what can we do about it? What, uh, what can we do to improve it? Um, sensory training is real important. Um, you can give beer to somebody, uh, but if they don't really know what they're looking for, or they don't know how to identify an off flavor or an attribute, um, then you might just be spinning your wheel. Um, one of the most important part of sensory training is, is simply like uh, nomenclature. You know, what, a lot of times people try something and say, well, what am I tasting right now? Um, I don't know how to describe it. I just know it's weird or it's good or it's, you know, you, you, you need a lexicon. So, you know, they have those famous old uh, flavor wheels. Uh, Draft Lab also came out with the beer flavor maps, um, malt flavor map, pop flavor map, all these cool things that help you better explain uh, what you're doing. You can also do flavor spikes. Um, you can make some homemade ones, uh, but also companies like Aroxa or um, Siebel, uh, they make spikes as well. So um, you can actually 
spike in the DMS, the dreaded DMS Lucy was talking about, or diacetyl, or yeah, anytime we do a sensory training, um, people usually, you know, groan and say, oh, this is, this is terrible. You're going to make me drink and smell some horrible stuff. Um, but if you really want to get your, your team on board, there is some fun stuff you can do as well. Um, this is uh, you, something came to me one day where, where somebody who was doing um, draft lab said, hey, this beer says it has water cracker flavor. Like, I don't know what a water cracker is. And then I thought, geez, well, how many other people don't know what some of these descriptors are? So, you know, there's fun things you can do. Like, you know, we did a, a New England IPA um, sensory one day. So I went out and got all sorts of different citrus fruit, tropical fruit. Um, and, you know, another thing is if you drink a bunch of different New England IPAs, you think in your head, maybe they're, they're all the same. But then when you're actually doing attribute sampling, you can determine that they are different. And these, you know, this was, we were testing four different IPAs we had. Uh, and, you know, people thought, no, they're all the same. They're just doing the IPAs. And then you'll see, you know, you can overlap these um, the spider graph and with, with all the attributes and you'll see, oh yeah, that makes sense. This one is more, a little more tropical. That one is a little more bitter. Um, so it doesn't always have to be flavor spikes um, and, and making people nauseous with what you're giving them. You can always make uh, sensory pretty fun too. Um, let's see, oops, sorry. Let me get back to that. So now we'll go back to what we're doing kind of daily in the lab here. Um, cell counting, um, we do yeast cell counting. We also, for the barrel-aged program, we do, um, we'll count for tanamycete cells as well uh, for pitching Brett over there. Um, so like I said, yeast cell counting is, is really important. Um, it's basically, you don't want to pitch blind. You know, I know, I know a lot of people you know, might just pitch by weight. Oh, maybe it's a pound per barrel or something like that. But um, you really want to make sure you're not grossly over pitching or under pitching. It can, it can definitely um, negatively affect your beer and also give you unpredictable fermentations. Um, so like I said, the brewers will come in, bring us the yeast slurry. Um, we're generally looking not to go anywhere past eight or nine generations uh, with our yeast. Um, so we're looking at the health of yeast, so viability. Uh, we stain it with methylene blue. Um, and if the cells don't reduce that stain and they hold the stain, then they're probably dead. Um, we're looking at the amount of cells per milliliter of beer per degree Play-Doh. Um, I should have put that in as well. Um, and then we recommend a pitch, rent, pitch count. Now, it would be great if the brewers always pitched what we told them to, but they also have to think about yeast management and maybe a certain tank has to provide a certain amount of yeast uh, over the course of the week. So they might say, well, you, you told me I need to pitch 350 liters. Why don't we see what 275 liters does? And, you know, sometimes it works. Sometimes um, we'll get that count back and say, nope, that's uh, it's too low. Uh, you need to put in, you know, another 25, 50, 75 liters. Um, so we do the knockout count, we'll do the yeast slurry count, uh, and then we'll count for the first three days. We do count the knockout count as day one. Um, so we, we're, we definitely wanna see it, we're counting during um, the exponential growth phase. So um, we wanna make sure that the cells are growing. Um, we do, you know, sometimes we'll see, we're not getting good day two, which is really where we should see the biggest jump. Um, and we do do some high gravity brewing. For those of you who don't know, that just means we make a more concentrated wort um, and then dilute it downstream. Um, so sometimes there gets to be a little stratification when we do that. Uh, so all we know is we have to um, recirculate that tank a little bit if we see that the cell count doesn't look right or maybe the gravity doesn't look right from there. Um, so we're, we're looking for positive growth each day. Um, you know, By the end, it's gonna be about three, three, four times what what we, uh, what we initially got for our first count. Um, so I will show you what, uh, if you haven't looked inside a, hemos in a uh, hemocytometer before, um, this is what you know, budding yeast, healthy budding yeast cells look like. Um, if you heard me say earlier that you know, cells that stain blue are most likely dead, 
there is an exception to that. Um, if you see these blue cells here and they're budding, well, but um, dead cells don't bud. So what's happening is they're taking in that, that stain, but they're also, um, because they're a little stressed because they're in the process of budding, they're, they haven't totally reduced that dye yet. So um, I count those as alive. And if you haven't seen these, basically these chambers, you, you'll count five of these boxes. Um, and, and then there's two chambers in a hemocytometer and you, you wanna get good um, correlation between the two counts. So if let's say I'm doing one count and I get 53 cell, alive cells and four dead cells and 26 alive cells and two dead cells, well, I know one of those was not right. Um, that's one of them is an outlier. Um, so you just got to redo it again because you really are just taking five cells out of five um, chambers out of 25 and extrapolating. So you want to make sure those two counts are as, are as close to the same as possible. Um, so, uh, you know, generally you like it within, you know, 10, 15%. Um, so other things, here's our, uh, Alkalizer, like I said, we have a, a Anton Parr DMA alkalizer, a DMA um, uh, alkalizer. So we can get ABV on this, original gravity, residual sugar, attenuation, calories. Um, all of this is important for us for different reasons. Um, the more data points you get, the more you can backtrack and figure out where something might have gone wrong. Where, why is there? Why did? Um, something not happen as it should have. Um, ABV, uh, we, we do that for labels. Um, we like it for, uh, for example, I was talking about, we have high gravity seltzer. Um, it, we, we blend to alcohol strength. So if we have right now like 11% seltzer and we wanna put out 5% seltzer, um, we need to know what the actual ABV is. And, and it's a lot more helpful to, to have a machine like this that helps us read it uh, versus just kind of doing a, you know, a vague math calculation um, that may or may not be close to right. Um, so it, it does help us hit our numbers pretty strongly. Um, any of you other brewers out there, you're probably in the age of Mick Ultra and everything like that. You're probably getting a lot of people contacting you about calories. So it is helpful to, you know, someone says, hey, what's your, what are the calories and you're shipping out of Boston? It's nice that I can, you know, spit something out to them right away to the hundredth and say, here's what the calories are in that beer. Um, and if you're really concerned about it, don't drink beer. But um, I digress. Um, yeah, so it's uh, one of the other things that, that the ABV is very helpful for is we do bottle conditioning with our Springdale sour beers, uh, barrel-aged sours. So um, we need to see how it's progressing with regards to uh, is, is the bottle conditioning doing what it's supposed to be doing, meaning undergoing another fermentation in the bottle and then um, actually carbonating the beer. So we can test the carbonation of the beer and we can also see if the ABV is rising, we can see if the sugars are lowering, and then we know that bottle conditioning is working. Um, we do weekly testing on packaged beer as well. Um, we're doing uh, color, head retention, turbidity, IBU. Some of these take a little bit to set up. So, um, and it's not that pressing that we need to know it day of. So we'll usually collect um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday's worth of, of packaging beer, packaged beers. And then um, once we have a fair amount of them, then run the, these tests. Um, it gives us uh, good, good metrics, good ways to track things. You know, we found out things that were going wrong in the brewery um, by, by seeing certain trends with IBU or turbidity or head retention or color. Um, let's see, forced fermentation. So we did go over that um, a little bit. Um, attenuation, um, that's, that's the biggest thing. If you get a stuck fermentation, well, where did that, what's the basis of that? Where did that happen? Um, so it, the first thing to look at is the forced fermentation. So if it fermented in our, on our, uh, in our lab, then we know it's not an issue of perhaps a, a problem with the mash temperature or something like that, then we can look somewhere else. Um, spunding, like I said, uh, it's really important for the spunding uh, aspect of, of what we do, the forced fermentation. So we'll get a forced fermentation, let's say it's 2.5 Plato is what, what our final grab is. Um, in order to capture some of that CO2, we might bung about a 
a Play-Doh above that. So we know when we get the gravity of 3.5, it's time to bung up that tank and capture that CO2 so we can naturally carbonate that beer. So those, those are two of the main reasons we really do forced fermentations on every beer we make. Um, so one thing about being in the in quality department, it's, it, it reminds me of the game of Clue, right? You're, you're, you're kind of a detective when something goes wrong. Um, there's an incident, you know, and Clue, it was a murder. Maybe in your brewery, your, your beer got murdered by some contaminants. Um, who did it or what did it? What's responsible? Um, where did this happen? You know, you get enough data points, you can hopefully isolate it to a certain area or a certain piece of equipment or even a certain fill head on the canner or something. Um, and how do we use all these clues to solve the mystery? So again, that's all these data points we're taking. Um, when there's a problem, okay, well, let's, let's look at the force firm. Let's look at, you know, across the board. How did the micro look on that? Where did it look on day one? Where did it look on, um, on in the bright tank? Um, a lot of places to look, just you want to collect that data for traceability. Um, and so going on to microbiological testing, again, we have that rapid detection um, PCR for beer spoiling microorganisms. This thing is great. It's the gene up. Um, we did have something called through uh, invisible sentinel called um, the Veriflow system, which is great, but it's an endpoint PCR. You can really only test for one microbe at a time. And at the very end, you have this little, um, it almost looks like a pregnancy test. Like you, you put your reagents on it, you, you pop it open. There's a baseline that says, um, if it's this color, then, then you're in trouble. And, but it, it, it fades a little. So, you know, you're kind of like, well, what does this amount of fading mean or versus, you know, if it's a little heavier line, um, our PCR actually gives us, um, hard data. Um, and it, it will let us know if we have an issue, uh, we can test for all these different things at once, lactobacillus, pediococcus, megaspora, pectinatus, wild yeast, Britannomyces. Um, and it'll let us know if uh, which one of these guys might be a problem and to what degree. Um, now, of course, you, you may know that um, PCR tests DNA. DNA can be dead. So, you know, a lot of times um, you, you might get dead DNA coming in with uh, hops if you do a lot of dry hopping. I, I talked to one person who they had the Veriflow system. They got a big hit on a New England IPA after they dry hopped it and they dumped the batch, um, which was tragic uh, because they probably didn't have an issue. But, uh, you know, the, the gene up, the, the real time rapid detection uh, really, you know, gives you a good idea of what, what's in your beer, if there is anything. Um, we also do micro pleating once a week in the slow times of the year, um, in the busy times of the year, maybe two times a week. Um, and we're, te we're plating on uh, LCSM for wild yeast and uh, Britannomyces, stuff like that. Um, we're doing HLP and NBB for, um, uh, for, for Lactopedia. Uh, so, you know, basically we'll play it on like a Tuesday. We'll read that next one on a, on a Wednesday the next week. Uh, if we think there might possibly be a problem, we can, you know, we can look at HLP might show growth a little earlier. So, um, you know, it's, it's very uh, useful tool. We, and um, microplating is, is very handy, uh, assuming that you're doing it correctly and you're not, you know, contaminating the place. Um, let's see. Also, we do packaging quality control. Um, we, a lot of that is done right at the packaging line. Um, so what's happening is, uh, we're checking for dissolved with oxygen. We're checking the, the bright tank. Uh, we're checking the cans. Um, we're checking the packaged carbon dioxide. We're checking that in the bright tank as well. We're doing seam checks. Um, we're doing ATP swabbing to make sure we're not getting anything living before we, we um, fire up that canning line. We want to make sure that, that there's nothing that's going to be contaminating um, uh, the product coming out. Um, Here's some other quality operations we do, not necessarily on a daily basis, but you know, over the course of, of a week or a month. Um, we're monitoring bottle conditioning, as they talked about. Uh, we're also testing for hop creep and dry hop beer. Um, you might have heard about this phenomenon. Um, sometimes you can see enzymes and hops further break down um, uh, 
dextrins into to fermentable sugars. And, and then if, if you have yeast in the can, you're just, you, all of a sudden you've got a bomb. Um, so we keep every beer we dry hop, we keep warm stored and we'll keep a few of them and we'll test them each week um, with CO2. We'll test the CO2. We'll test um, same thing we do for bottle conditioning, CO2, uh, residual sugar and ABV. And hopefully it's, it's static and doesn't change. Um, we do titratable acidity for our sour beers. Um, I don't know how many of you do that for sour beer. I would strongly recommend that as opposed to um, pH. Uh, pH is important, but um, titratable acidity gives you a better indication of um, truly how, how your beer tastes. It's, it's more uh, from an acidity standpoint because um, pH is really just talking about um, hydrogen ions, free hydrogen ions, um, titratable acidity, you're really testing uh, lactic acid, which is a predominant acid that you're going to have in the beer. Um, dissolved oxygen and wort, you know, we don't do it every knockout, but we want to make sure that we are getting the right amount of DO going into our wort uh, to feed the yeast, you know, help the yeast. Um, we do ATP, and te ATP testing in the cellar to ensure our cleaning was effective. Like I said, we do seltzer and cider operations, bench top flavor trials, and environmental swabbing. We have, um, we'll do some swabbing with these cool little swabs that are like sponges, and we can run those on the PCR too to see if we have problem areas. <clears throat> now is more of a, a tour where you can kind of see things we've, we've been doing. Um, this is us making media. So this is Mondays is media making day. So this is HLP media. Um, I would have wished my former lab tech uh, was wearing sleeves or a lab coat there. Um, maybe that's why he's our former lab tech. Um, just kidding. But yeah, so he's in the laminar flow hood making, um, <laughs> making media. You can buy most of this media pre-made. It's just a lot cheaper. If you have the ability to do it and you can do it aseptically, um, you, you know, it's, it's cheaper to do it that way. Uh, here are some of our plates that we make also. The ones on the left, which are uh, a I apologize now, I'm, I'm colorblind, but I believe they're red. Um, that's the NBB for Lactopedio, and the ones on the right is uh, LCSM for uh, wild yeast uh, and, and uh, Britannomyces. Um, these are examples of what hits look like on plates. Um, generally, if we see you know, a few amount of colonies, we definitely wanna see what they are. We, will, we can take colony picks, run those on the PCR, um, We'll gram stain them if they're if if they're bacteria and their catalase negative. Um, but generally, if we're we have almost a threshold of like uh, ten colonies each one of these. If, if there's ten colonies or more, it could really be a serious problem. Not that it can't be with one, but um, that's where we really start looking at it and 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 looking at other potential problems. Um, this is what a gram stain looks like. Um, the one on the right, you don't want to see. Those are uh, gram positive rods, indicating that there's a good chance that there's a lot of those colonies that's going to spoil your beer. <coughs> the ones on the left, um, gram negative. Now, there are gram negative beer spoilers as well, um, like pectinatus, megaspora. But um, yeah, they're so the ones on the right, uh, they take up the stain. It helps you classify what the, the bacteria is. Um, here is how we do our color tests. You know, we basically filter the beers. <laughs> we run it through the spectrophotometer at 430 uh, uh, nanometers and uh, 700. Um, and then we, it spits out a number at us. So, you know, usually it's usually in the right spot, but we have seen issues, you know, examples where someone didn't properly clean out a, the, the brew house after brewing, you know, a stout type beer and then doing a house lager and then finding out, hey, why is the house lager reading a hell of a lot higher than it's supposed to be? Um, and then, you know, we figured out the problem. This is, you know, <laughs> the turbidity meter is pretty simple. You basically just degas the beer, you put it in a cuvette, put it in the meter, hit play, and then boom, it gives you a number. Um, and, NT, and the units are NTUs. Um, on the right, this is, it's kind of a crude, um, head retention test, a head foam stability test. Um, I don't know if, if this is what you do over there, Lucy, um, but uh, this is, yeah, this is our, how we measure foam. Basically, it's just a matter of, of time and volume. Um, so 
but it, it's it's accurate enough that we can notice trends, uh, and that's really what we care most about. Um, again, here's a picture of our PCR. Um, so this is what a result might look like from the PCR. Um, if we ran five things here, everything is absent except um, you'll look at RT271, that says presumed presence. Um, this is for a specific, it says FAM. This FAM channel is for um, hop, it, it's for non-hop resistant bacteria. So not necessarily a beer spoiler, but it could be an indication that something wasn't cleaned properly. Um, you might see it about value here, it says CP38.42. Um, that means crossing point. And what that means is what the PCR is doing is it's taking DNA, breaking it down, and then replicating it. And it's just growing exponentially. So it finally at 38.42, it started reading that there was DNA there. And that's really late in the process because we do 44 cycles. So that's something where you look at and say, well, maybe we should, we should look at, you know, if there was some cleaning issues here, but um, I'm not terribly concerned about this being a spoiler. Uh, of course, I'll still look at all the micro we collect, but um, this wouldn't be something that I would look at and say, stop, you know, stop the canning. We, we, we can't move forward with this. Um, this is a close-up of our alkalizer. You got to um, degas the beer. It's got to be pretty much, it's pretty finicky. It's got a room temp, but then it spits out some really good information to you. Um, here's kind of what some of the readout looks like. It'll give you a little more information also. Um, but again, we record every beer, every beer we package, uh, we, we run through the alkalizer. Um, on the right, this is our can piercer. This is how we test our DOs and CO2s in the can. Um, on the left, left, if you remember early in the show, I showed you the, the can cutter, the thing that cuts into the seam. Um, then we put that over a, uh, basically a microscope and it, 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 it'll show us what it looks like. So that's it on the left. You can see this is what a seam looks like. So it's basically the overlap of the can lid and the top of the can. So the seamer rolls over it and folds it. Um, so if there's a problem with these folds, we measure the distance between them, then, you know, there'll be a big exclamation point saying, uh-oh, you know, let's, let's look further into this. Uh, like I said, it's more, more often than not, it's, it's pretty, pretty good, spot on. Um, on the right here, we're testing, um, the packaging QC team is testing dissolved oxygen in the bright tank. Uh, to make sure it's good to go to the next level. Um, we do our go, no go, and then we do our dissolved oxygen and CO2 and, and make sure we can then run it through the uh, uh, canning line. Uh, and lastly, you know, everybody does this. You, you, you temp temperatures and gravities uh, every day. Uh, you, beer is a living thing. Um, it doesn't rest for us. It doesn't take vacations. When we take vacations, every day you got to take a hydrometer, um, read your sugars. You can see how the fermentation is progressing. Um, I'm guessing every single brewer or quality person who's watching this, uh, I don't have to say this to them, but just in case somebody's not familiar with, uh, with what, what this is, it basically is just giving you, it's reading residual sugar. So, um, you know, if you started out with 13.5 degree Play-Doh and you, you want to see that go down, you want to make sure that because the alcohol, uh, the yeast is converting the sugar into alcohol and CO2. So that sugar is going away. So you want to see that um, hydrometer uh, reading drop. Um, and lastly, this is, this is our old ugly uh, orbital shaker. But yeah, this is, this is us doing um, some more force firms. Sometimes today we're, we have five different beers going in the tank. So I'm going to have a really, uh, really busy orbital shaker tomorrow. So um, I think that's pretty much it. This is really just what we do. This is quality right here in a nutshell. So um, with that, I will stop sharing. Well, that was great. That was quite the tour. That was awesome. Um, we are I just right up at five o'clock. So just wanted to quickly thank everybody. It does not mean you have to leave or go anywhere. Hopefully Jeremy can stick around for a couple minutes. I can. Um, Awesome. As we field some questions that we've gotten some great questions um, while you were giving us that tour, but I um, just want to thank everybody, let you know, also we'll be sending out a recording of this 
um, to all the participants and just posting it on our YouTube channel um, probably in a week or so. And so that'll be there. Um, so on to the good questions. Um, first one, actually, Kevin has two questions um, and they're similar. So I'll throw them both at you. Um, first question is what equipment have you prioritized as the next must have for your lab and why? And then the other question is, um, what are your like to have items that you don't have now? Very similar. Huh. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, so it's funny, this, this is not very sexy, um, but one thing, one thing I really want is, um, so a lot of you might use Google, you know, Google Sheets, Google Docs, all this stuff to, to, for data gathering. Um, I'm in the process of, of really kind of pushing to, to get a more uh, comprehensive, you know, cloud-based software that can really organize all your data well and, and have other, um, each part of the process speak to one another. And, and that really, for me, traceability is really important. Um, and, and I don't want to have to go searching for somebody else's sheets to figure out what might have happened here or there. Um, we, it's something we're, we're at a size and we're at an age where we have so much data. We're about 10 years old now. We have so much data stored up that we need something a little more streamlined. So that's, that's my have to have. Um, want to have, yeah, I, I, I think if I got another, uh, another person in here and got GC and got trained up on it, um, I would love to have that. It's, it's, it, it provides a lot of good in information. You know, as a lager brewery, we're, we're concerned about certain compounds. Um, right now, we, for VDK testing, we do sensory VDK. So, you know, we, we do like heat it up with the, um, uh, the immersion. Um, why am I blanking on the name there? The uh, sous vide, right? The sous vide cooker. I uh, cook it for a sample for six, uh, 30 minutes, cool it down, and then just sniff is, is do, I, do I get diacetyl or not? Um, you know, GC would certainly help with that, give us a real hard data on whether we can move the beer to the next step. Um, so I would say those are the two things that I would really like uh, moving forward. Um, one of the questions, are you looking at the ERP software or orchestra? So we actually have, we, we have orchestrated um, for inventory, right? All the, the office, the, the, accountant, uh, the packaging manager, the seller manager, all these guys, um, we use orchestrated is great for uh, data gathering uh, in, in inventory uh, management. Um, they'll readily admit it's not ideal from a, a, a quality standpoint. So yeah, we're looking at other ERP. Um, uh, there's other beer software like Beer 30 or, or Vicinity, um, things like that, that can really track the prop the, the process from when your raw materials arrive on the dock until they leave. Um, so that's, those are the things I'm really looking at. And when you figure that out, you've got to come back and tell us all about it. Cause that's a huge question we get is this data management and how do I keep this all together in the lab? We use Google drive, um, cause it's free and it's there right. and right. really accessible, but, um, but and yeah. it, it really works. I mean, we have like, we have a lot of good data and it's stored. And, and um, again, that's another thing to, to stress about people um, wanting to start a quality program um, or, or expand a quality program. It's, it's a great tool. Uh, Google, it's, it's cheap. It's, it's, you know, it can be clunky. If you, if you know what you're doing on that, which I'm not, I'm not an ace on it, but if you know what you're doing on it, um, you, it's a good way to store your data for a while. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, one of the questions we got um, from Todd is, can you speak more on the results of recirculating a beer to get a more accurate cell count and gravity reading? We're just curious as to how much of a deviation has occurred under your observations of pre and post homogenization. Thanks. Okay, so he, that's a good question. It's a great question. Um, so we mostly see those, those issues with the high gravity brews. Um, Sometimes we, we brew high gravity, sometimes out of necessity based on the size of our system. We have a 60 barrel um, brew house. We can put 80 barrels out of a um, lower gravity beer. So for example, our post shift Pilsner, we, we um, do high gravity brewing. So the next day when I come in and I take a gravity, 
or whoever's doing the gravity takes the gravity and I do a cell count, I'll probably do the cell count before they do the gravities. And if I see that that cell count, I'm looking for our loggers. I want them to grow somewhere around uh, 80 to a hundred percent day from, from the previous day. Uh, so, well, our, our sink's kind of blown up, sorry. Um, so if I don't see that, if I see a really poor, poor um, growth, I'm then gonna go to the guy taking the gravity or me, I'll take the gravity and realize that, okay, the, the gravity of this beer is supposed to be 11.2 for knockout. <laughs> right now, this gravity is at um, 12.6. Well, that's a, that's a clear indicator that it's not mixed up right. So the work that's going in there is much higher than 11.2 because we are diluting it down. So if I see something that's higher than the original gravity, that's, you know, that's just red flag right away. Like this has to get researched. And that proves my point when I look at the, the poor cell growth and see that it didn't really grow much, then I, I'm, I'm well aware. And then once it's, we will hook it up to a sanitary research um, and then I'll take another sample and then things look generally like they're supposed to. So that 11.2 from knockout the day before might now be down to 10, 10, five. Um, and the cell count will be closer to like a 75, 80% growth. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, Krista has a great question and I will okay. read it exactly how she wrote it. Um, at the brewery I work at, we have, um, an aerobic microbe that continues to hit on LMDA and WLN. It's a cat plus and gram plus bacillus with spores, bacillus subtilis likely. We've noticed that it only occurs post dry hop, which makes me speculate this bacteria originates on hops. It's not a beer spoiler, but boy, howdy, am I tired of seeing it pop up. <laughs> Any recommendations or should I just start setting it a place, Matt, at our lunch table? I think it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a lot to unpack. Um, I guess the, the follow-up question would be, is are you only seeing that um, in your dry hop beers, um, we, we see a lot of activity, like some of our dry hop plates look absolutely disgusting. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where, um, geez, we're, you know, we're, we're hopping at these days. I mean, the, the collective, we, you know, three, four, five pounds per barrel, maybe more. Um, yeah, you you there's a good chance you're pulling in some stuff there. Um, the chance that it makes it to the final Beer. I, I assume you're 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 saying these these are post dry hop. Is that what she was saying? Um, let's see. It says yes. Occurs post dry hop. Yep. Yeah. Um, it only occurs post dry hop. Okay. Yeah. I I don't know if there's really an answer for that. I think it's it's. <laughs> I, I hate to say this as a quality manager. The answer might just be la 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 la. You know, just <laughs> um, it's. It's there, you know it's going to be there. It's it's consistently there, um, and it, it's it's why we stopped doing certain um, PCR runs uh, post dry hop because PCR, you know, every reagent is pretty expensive, so we're just wasting money because we, we end up seeing we end up seeing hits on it. So um, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. I would just say I wouldn't stress about it unless you start seeing it in other places. So give it a mat at the lunch table and let it just hang. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Be friends. Yeah. Accept one another. Yeah, and I think just tracking, you know, at that point, right? Just knowing yep. it's there and, and being ready to, um, knowing it's going to pop up. Oh, yeah, I think the first time I saw that, I, I, my, you know, if I had hair, it would have been on fire and running to jet, <laughs> like, whoa, stop the presses, look at this. Um, but then you, you, you realize, you, you, you you learn the ebb and flow of your brewery and you learn your processes and you learn what you, you know, the best thing you can hope for is for everything to be predictable. Um, mm -hmm. That, that you, you know, like when, when you're about to take that plate out, you're like, I know it's going to be on here. I know it's not going to spoil the beer. Um, I'm going to look at it, go, huh? Mark it down, write the data down and then you have it. And hopefully it doesn't go any further than that. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that's really nice to have too is a beer library. Yep. So if you have something like that pop up, 
Hmm. It's a head scratcher, but you can still look at it down the road. And, and if something does come up, you've got something there to test. Yeah, I'm sorry. And thank you for, for mentioning that. I, I completely forgot to mention the beer library. That's another very cheap thing any brewery can do. Um, put aside beer from your packaging run. We do 30, 60, 90 days for um, an ambient temp, 30, 60, 90 days in the cooler. Um, and and then you have beer A as a reference. So if you get some complaints, you can go back and, and try to find it. Um, but B, uh, you know, we, we do our library beer dumps every Monday from the previous date that's already expired. Um, and we've found things that way too. Um, unfortunately, you know, we've, we've found things that, that did not hit, you know, coming out of, coming out of packaging, but sure as hell did, you know, 90 days later. And that helped, yeah. that helped us to change our, our process. Excellent. Um, I think that's all the, those are all the questions we have had so far. Lucky number 13 um, of questions is our last one. Um, and we're a little over, so I'll, I'll let you go shortly. Um, but I want to make a couple just quick plugs. We do have two more, at least for right now, behind the tap room it's coming up. Um, March 23rd, Creature Comfort. Um, April 27th, QC2 Lab. We'll do that. We've asked you all to do the same. So we'll we'll go through it and bring our computer around and show everybody our stuff. Um, if anybody knows any other really awesome quality um, programs out there that you want to see, send me the person's contact info and I will see what I can do. Um, we also have yeast management workshop coming up on the 11th and a diastaticus workshop coming up on April 8th. So those would be really good times to dive into some of the questions that you have about those things. Um, other than that, thank do, you so do, much. Do we have this time one? to plug our, pro our project or no? Oh my gosh, yes, let's <laughs> plug our project. Anybody wants to hear us stick around? I totally forgot it was on my mind though. Yes, let's talk about our research. Okay, um, so basically, you know, doing lager brewing, you, you let the beer sit in a tank for a long time. Um, and you have a general idea of things that are happening, but we wanted to know on more of a, we wanted to look deeper into our process. Like what, what really is happening? How, how quickly are compounds arising and then getting reduced? Um, what's staying in the beer? What's, are, are there big changes going from week five to week six? Is, is aging that long necessary? Um, so we wanted to tackle these questions as well as carbonation. Um, we, as I said, we naturally carbonate through spunding. There's other ways to naturally carbonate as well through croisoning or a lot of people just force carbonate. Um, so we want to test a few things. One, these volatiles that I'll let Lucy talk to. Um, and then also compare these three beers. We're going to do a croisin. We have a croisin beer, a spunded beer, and a force carb beer. And we're going to put them in a mixed four pack. This is pretty cool. Uh, we, the draft lab uh, uh, sensory software I was talking about, they also do consumer facing software as well called Sample Ox. So we're going to put the beers out in Sample Ox and have, the, have our customers do blind tasting to see which they prefer. They can do the same things we do when we do our sensory on our phone. Um, which do they prefer of, of the three? And then there's also going to be a random fourth one that you won't know what it is either. Um, and you're going to be able to rank the beers hedonically. You're going to be able to say what you like or dislike about it based on rating system. Um, so the carbonation is one point, but I'd like uh, Lucy can certainly talk to the, the volatiles that we're testing for as well. Yeah, so we are in our lab testing the volatiles um, and we're looking at SO2, DMS, VDK. We've got a whole bunch of esters on there and a couple of alcohols like isoamyl alcohol. And is that the only one I think? Uh, oh, phenethyl or- Yeah, phenethyl alcohol, alcohol. yep. Yes. Um, and so these are tricky um, for us. A couple of reasons is once you crack that vial open, we've got two of each. Um, that's it for volatiles because they start going away. Um, and so we've got three different methods that we have to use to look at these. Um, for most of the part, we're using um, GC mass spec. So VDK is kind of cool because it doesn't, diacetyl doesn't show up very well on the mass spec. So I actually have to have the electron capture detector um, for that one because it's so much more sensitive. 
Um, and then for all the other volatiles, I'm working on a method that will just look at them all in one um, run on the GC so that they can all be taken care of there. Um, mass spec is amazing because in chromatography, you send your sample off into the instrument and you have this 60 meter tube that your sample goes through and separates out all these compounds. And then the mass spec shows you these, each peak you get as a compound. And you can look at the fingerprint of that based on the mass spectra of it. And it will identify it for you, which is just, it's just the coolest thing every time. So we can take all these samples and look at what comes off of them and identify these compounds and then go through the, a little bit more laborious process of quantifying them. Um, but we've just started running some of the samples, um, especially for VDKs and seeing the beautiful trend as they, they go up and then they come back down um, and hitting the mark with your points where you've, you've tested it and said, this is past the test. So that's kind of- oh, really? Nice. I didn't even notice that yeah. yet. That's good to know. Yep. It's like right on the, it's right where it should. Awesome. Um, and then SO2 is a little bit more um, involved. It's more of a wet chemistry method that we're using right now. And um, we've got a student, an undergrad, who's a senior, who's working on that right now, trying to make it a little bit less um, waste focused and a little bit more environmentally friendly and then going through all the samples. So yeah, it's a, it's a fun project with a lot of samples. So I'm excited. Yeah, and if, if anybody wants to join from a consumer standpoint from the greater Boston area, we're going to be selling the beer out of the tap or out of the tap room um, when it's ready. And uh, all you have to do is follow either uh, us on Instagram or, or the newsletter, and we'll let you know when that beer is ready and it can be picked up. And it's open to anybody. Excellent. Wish I lived closer. Darn it. I'll, I'll get you some. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I can make a trip, probably. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Me too. So. All right. I think that's everything that we were going to share. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I... I had it in my head and then I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, if anybody has questions for any of us, please feel free to email um, the labsusm.qc2. You can, for, you can put in my email also when you send anything out. If anybody has questions they want to email me about. Excellent. We'll do that as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. I appreciate it. It was All fun. Right. Cool. All right. Bye, everyone.